Hey everyone, today we're refactoring a classic enemy AI script sent in by a subscriber. It patrols waypoints, spots the player, chases and attacks. It works, but the code is doing way too much in one place. Let's clean it up step by step using solid refactoring thinking and a few rider tricks to make it more readable, maintainable and ready for bigger features. Let's get into it. Before we start doing any refactoring, let's take a good look at the code as it currently stands. I've added some clear section comments so that we can walk through it together and understand the overall structure. At the top, we have all the public fields. We've got movement speeds for patrol and chase, the patrol points array, some detection settings like range and field of view, and some combat values like attack range, damage, and cooldown. And then we have some private fields, so the player transform, rigid body, the current patrol index, and a few others. In start, we're grabbing the rigid body, finding the player by tag, and setting the initial patrol target to the first waypoint. Now I'm going to page down so that we can see the heart of the script, which is the update method. First, we're calculating the distance to the player. Then we do our detection check, figure out the direction to the player, calculate the angle to see if they're in our field of view, check if they're in range, and finally do a raycast to make sure nothing's blocking line of sight. If the player is detected, we enter a chase mode and set velocity directly on the rigid body towards the player and rotate to face them. And if we're close enough and off cooldown, we're gonna grab the player's health component and deal damage right here in the update method. Now, if the player isn't detected, we're gonna to switch to patrol mode and move towards our current target point at patrol speed. And when we get close enough, we increment the patrol index and update the target to the next waypoint. Now there's a little debug ray here, and there's also an on collision enter that does a backup attack if we physically bump into the player. Now this might be a little bit redundant with the range check and update, but I guess it's here as a safety net. So as we've been looking at this, what's been standing out to us? This is a single script doing quite a lot, and it's probably gonna grow bigger. It's managing data, it's detecting the player, it's deciding behavior, it's moving the enemy, and it's handling attacks. Everything lives here in one place. Now that's fine when you're first getting something working, but as we think about maintaining or expanding this code, we can start to see that there's some challenges coming. But not to worry, let's get started with a little refactor of this class. First things first, down here in the bottom right, this pencils icon opens Rider's inspection controls. When working on a refactoring, it can be especially helpful to toggle on your style inspections. Notice that it's already starting to give some hints based on my own code style settings, such as not including the redundant private keyword. Now you can also toggle on inlay information, and this is especially useful if you need to see Unity specific context without switching windows, but it also gives you inline hints and other information. Then you can also switch up your highlight level. When I'm recording a video, usually I leave it at syntax, but when doing any refactoring, I would suggest moving it all the way over to the right so that you see all of the hints and suggestions. Now let's start by removing redundant code. These redundant field initializers and the redundant private keyword are completely unnecessary, and trimming these first reduces the amount of information we have to process and keep in our heads. Just now I was using the context menu, which I can bring up with control period. But another really great refactoring shortcut to use is extend selection or shrink selection, which for me is alt shift right or alt shift left. So for example, if I'm close to the start method, I can hit alt shift right once and it'll select the symbol. If I hit right one more time, it'll select the entire line. And if I hit right one more time, still holding down alt and shift, it'll select the entire logical block. This start method doesn't adhere to my code standards. So using the context menu, I can go to reformat and clean up and I can reformat the selection that I have. You can also get this from the top menu. If you go up to code and you come all the way down to reformat code, you get the same kind of options, but not quite as many because one of the nice things that you can do here is actually detect code style settings. So you can see if the style here is different than yours and how it's different. And you can choose to update your settings if you like the way that this code is presented better than what you do. So for example, here there's no inline curly brace and I'm not using any curly braces in my logical if but I'm happy with my settings. So I'm gonna grab that selection again, reformat and clean up and reformat and imply syntax style. So again, just by removing some of this redundancy and then formatting the code into the way that you're used to reading it can sometimes take down the cognitive burden of doing a big refactor or trying to understand someone else's code. Anyway, that's enough about code cleanup and shortcuts. Let's take a closer look at this update method where all this logic is happening. There's a lot of things happening in this update method, and I've added a few comments here to segment out the different sections. We can start by extracting most of these logical blocks into their own methods. 
the player detected variable is only used in the update method. So let's change it to be a local variable. Then I'm just going to cursor up to the start of the section I want and use Alt Shift Right Arrow Shortcut to grab the logical block that I want. Then Control Shift R for refactor. We're going to extract this as a method. Let's give it a decent name. Maybe we call this Detect Player. Then I'm going to select my return type to be the player detected Boolean. I don't necessarily want to bring in the direction to player as an out variable. Ryder is suggesting that I bring that in because it must be used further down in the update method. But I'm going to deselect that and we'll fix any problem that that creates. If you're new to refactoring in Ryder, notice that you get a nice preview window at the bottom there. So I'm happy with this. Click Next. Now, because I unticked the out variable, I can see already in the right column there is one error. Let's just scroll down a little bit. Here it is only used for the debugging. So I'm just going to comment that out. Our new method looks basically the same, except there is a little bit of redundancy. We can just return the result immediately. We don't need to store it in a local variable. OK, now let's come back up to the update method and do the same thing for these other logical blocks. You can just click on Update in the top header. It'll take you right up to the method. Notice that I've got a nice yellow hint under the player detected variable. That's because the member level field by the same name is not being used anymore, and this local variable is hiding it. If I bring up the context menu again, we can go directly to the conflict and just remove it. Now back down into update, I'm just going to grab all the logic for the chase phase. Let's refactor this as a method. We can just call it chase player. Writer's actually pretty good at coming up with names for these little blocks. Let's hit next. Now, how about this inline attack logic? Let's come right to where we're grabbing the player's health component. We'll extract this as a method. Let's choose a decent name for it. How about perform attack? Then we have one more logical block that stands out here, and that's the patrol phase. We'll grab all of that, extract this to a method. We could call this patrol movement, but maybe let's call it patrol to next point. This little logical block actually seems to be doing two things. It's choosing a waypoint and then also moving to it. OK, well, now we've broken the update method down into some logical sections. If I select the entire update method, I could run some formatting on it and make sure it lines up with my style. Now, the extract to method refactoring is one of the simplest refactorings you can do. And what I really like about it is that now our update method is so simple, it's very easy to reason about it. In fact, the only bit of complexity we still have is in the if statement. And there's nothing stopping us from selecting that and extracting that into a method as well. So let's go ahead and extract that and just give it a simple method name like can attack. Now we could just clean up some space and we certainly don't need this comment. So let's zoom out here and just page down to see these new methods that we've extracted. Take a look at these first two methods. They look awfully similar, don't they? In fact, the biggest difference between them is that one of them is calculating waypoints, which I would argue should be its own method. Why don't we call it update patrol waypoint? With the new method created, I'm actually going to select it all. Then I'll move it down here in the class so that we have the two movement related methods one above the other. What's fundamentally different about them now? Not very much, right? In fact, you could argue that update patrol waypoint doesn't belong in here at all. We could just cut it and come right back up here to below the patrol to next waypoint method and put it here. Now, at this point in the refactoring, we might have some choices to make. One thing you might think about doing is you might just want to create a move method that just takes in a position Maybe it would also take in a speed, but then all you would have to do is basically exactly what you're doing in the methods below. Just calculate a direction, set a velocity, and do a rotation. Now, this is not a bad strategy. If we just took this a little bit further, what would that mean? Well, then you'd probably do something like instead of chasing the player, you'd just move to the player's position. Instead of patrolling to the next point, you would move to a target point. But notice that in each logical path in our update method, we are moving the player somewhere. So let's just do a little bit of cleanup. We don't need these old methods anymore. I'm just going to collapse them and control X. If I come up to the first call we're making to the move method, I could just move this out of the logical block and remove the other call in the else. But there's still a few problems here. The first one is that we're only passing the player position in and not the waypoints. Inside the move method was only handling one kind of speed. And we still have our update patrol waypoint logic here in this class. So if we think about it, what we have here is two types of behavior that vary only in some minor details, where we're going and how fast we want to go there. To me, this seems like two different movement strategies. Now, yeah, you could cook that into methods right there in the enemy controller, but let's explore another way of doing this. Let's suppose I have an interface I've movement strategy. 
It will just have one method that takes in a vector 3 as a target. Then we could probably implement a chase strategy. Now, that might need a reference to, say, the rigid body. We could keep the chase speed here, take that in through the constructor. Our execute method would just calculate the direction, set the velocity, and rotate the transform. Then maybe you would also control any chase animations or whatever else you had to do here. Now, likewise, you could have a patrol strategy. I'll just let Copilot fill this out since it's basically the same. However, this is a lot of boilerplate for no good reason. As soon as you've implemented two concrete versions of a pattern and you see that they're almost the same, this is the perfect opportunity to extract a base class. And in fact, since we've hardly written any logic, we might as well just remove these two strategies and start from the base abstract class. So here we'll have an abstract version of that. Copilot already knows what I want because I was already implementing it. Now, because both of our movement strategies have very similar execute methods, let's add another method here that will just be an execute hook. This method will call every time the execute method runs, and it can contain the custom logic that's unique for each of the strategies. So instead of execute being an abstract method, here's where we can calculate the direction, the velocity, and the rotation. When we're done that, we'll call the on execute hook. So now our concrete classes can be actually quite simple. If we implement the chase strategy, we're really just passing constructor variables to the base class. Our on execute hook would have any specific chase logic. Likewise, our patrol movement strategy would do something similar. So what would that mean for our enemy controller class then? If we come back to the main class, right up here at the top in the movement section, let's have two strategies defined. We could have a chase strategy and a patrol strategy. Then we can initialize both strategies in the start method. Now, if we come down to our update method again, here we can choose which strategy we want to use based on whether or not we've detected the player. First, we choose the target, then we can choose the strategy. Then we just execute the strategy on the target. Now, that's one line too many. Let's inline that target variable. And now we can remove that redundant move method. We can remove the call and the implementation. But that still leaves one more thing. We have this update patrol waypoint method here which doesn't really seem to belong. In fact, it would be nice if we weren't doing this sort of selection in the update method at all. What if instead we gave each strategy a way to figure out its own target? We could try something like adding a funk of type vector3 into the base class. Now, everywhere we are referencing the target, instead we just execute that funk and get back the target that's appropriate for this strategy. We could pass that funk in through the constructor, but of course we'll have to update our two concrete strategies. For our chase movement strategy, all we really have to do is come up into the signature, and here we'll pass in that func, and then we need to pass that down into the base class as well. Now, the patrol movement strategy is going to be slightly different. Here, instead of passing in a func of type bool, let's pass in all the waypoints. Now, we can't pass that into the base class, but what we could do instead is create a static method here. This method can return a func of type bool, and it'll take in the rigid body in those patrol points as input params. So here, let's have a variable for a zero index, and then we could also set some kind of default target, and then all we need to do is return a func of type vector3 that calculates the next waypoint we want to travel to, and this is basically the same logic that we have in the enemy controller. This gets passed down into the base class, and our enemy controller doesn't need to worry about calculating waypoints anymore. In fact, we only have some simple changes to make. Back here, when we're initializing our strategies, for the chase strategy, we can pass in a func that calculates the player's position. And for the patrol strategy, we just pass in the patrol points. If we just scroll down to the update method now, we don't need this else condition anymore. And in fact, we can delete the implementation as well. Now there's one more thing to clean up, and that is target selection. The execute method does not need to take in a target. If we come back to our base class, here, where we have the execute method, let's control shift R, refactor. We're going to change the signature. I'm going to remove the input parameter and click next. Notice that's empty. And if we come back to the enemy controller, where we're calling execute, and that has also been cleaned up. So we could go on with this kind of refactoring because there's essentially two other behaviors in update. One is player detection. The other one is attacking. But this is all the time I've got for today. So I'm just going to leave you with those thoughts. Hopefully today's video gave you some ideas, things you can do while you're refactoring your code. Remember that refactoring is an iterative process. You're going to come back, review, think things over, think about how other people approach the same problem, and consider carefully the pros and the cons of your approach. 
And not only your code, but when you're looking at the code in some of the assets that you have or some open source or anything that you see on this channel, what are the pros and cons? Would this kind of approach work for me? Critically evaluating your own code or someone else's code is one of the best ways to get better at programming. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Feel free to join us on Discord if you like. Hit the bell. We've got a new video every Sunday. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.